Hello, Matt Weller. Hey, Dale. How you doing? It has oh, been. Oh, my God. Long. What's it been? Five years or so? It I mean, probably yeah. has. Yeah, it was a previous iteration of this webinar, but, uh, but hopefully okay. we can start oh, making uh, this a more regular thing. Yeah, it was FX Street. Okay, and you were there, and uh, you know your prayers were with me when I was going through a difficult time. I hope the five years have treated you well. It's great to have you back, Matt. And what a day for you to be here. So um, there is a green box for you to be able to share your screen to talk about uh, the markets that are on your radar if Steve will stop sharing his screen. Steve, are you still here? Okay, let's see. Yes, Coach, sorry. I'm also uh, sorry. Okay. You there go. you go. That's okay. Okay, so Matt, there's a green box. If you hover your mouse over the drop-down menu that says share. Yeah, yeah, working our way through uh, my typical technological uh, Yeah, yeah. There we are. All right, you guys see me here? Yeah, there we go. So, uh, yeah, let's start off with the dollar in the face of what's been going on here. Uh, take it away, Matt. Tell me what you're seeing here. I always liked your clean charts. So, you know, it's all really sticks and moving averages, right? That's what yep. you use. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think okay. a lot of traders go through different journeys with their charts, but the, the one that kind of works for me, and I think I've seen a number of other very successful traders do, is, is you learn about all these indicators. You, you don't want to miss anything, so you start slapping on you know, uh, RSIs and MACDs and stochastics and Fibonaccis and Elliott wave counts. And at a certain point, you just have so much on your charts that it can kind of overwhelm the, the signal at the end. You're never going to get every indicator in agreement. And even if you do, that doesn't guarantee a successful trade. So I've, I've kind of switched back to simpler, cleaner charts. And, and that's worked for me yeah. and, and maybe some of your traders. Yeah, that's well. a problem. Analysis, paralysis. You're right. You never get everything to line up. It's all a probability game. So uh, what are you thinking here, Matt? Uh, you know, we, we've had a nice run in the dollar of, uh, People have um, talked about the dollar entering the bear market uh, several times, and the dollar always bounces back. Uh, do you think that uh, par is in the cards here? I do. Dixie? I, I do. Okay. I'm relatively bullish here uh, on the. This is the dollar index, of course. Right. Um, and, and I think I, I caught the tail end of, of Steve's interview, and I agree with him that the Fed will likely be cutting rates, which, uh, and I do think about two this year is, is my current expectation, probably in the second half of the year. Usually that would be a headwind for a currency. Interest rates tend to have a direct correlation. But we have to remember that all currencies are relative value games. So if the Fed, you know, cuts interest rates, say, two times this year, in a vacuum, that might be negative for the U.S. dollar, but we have to compare it to some of its major rivals. And I think you look at Europe, you look at Japan, you look at U.K., they all have their own economic issues and, in fact, are, are deeper into the stimulus uh, from a monetary side uh, to, to try to promote their currencies. So I think – or promote their economies more so. It's, it's really hurting their currency. So um, okay. So, so you you're excellent with fundamentals. fundamentals. You're excellent yeah. with fundamentals. So I have a question here, and it's something sure. I've noticed with uh, my call for lower yields in the U.S. is that yields have been falling faster. If you look at the Bund and you look at the 10-year note, uh, yields have been falling faster on the 10-year note than the Bund. So isn't there the beginnings of uh, an interest rate differential beginning to start to move uh, in favor of the euro, with the boom not falling as fast over the last, say, four or five months as U.S. yields have? I I think that is, and that is maybe something traders are looking at. This chart is not really uh, – okay. oh, I need two axes here. Um, so this is not really uh, supporting your view yet, pin to scale okay. uh, uh, on the left scale. So this is uh, roughly what you're getting at. And if we look yeah. maybe more so at a shorter term basis, you have the German 10-year yield in blue and the U.S. 10-year yield in, in, in the candlesticks here. Yeah. Um, so they've been keeping relative pace. I do think your point is well taken that on a very short term basis, uh, that there are some differences there. But yeah. uh, a as we look at it, you know, all these major central banks have to cut interest rates. So okay. um, I, I think the lackluster growth in Europe and the fact that they're already at the lower bound, th there's only so many tools in a central bank's um, toolbox, if you will. And, and 
Europe is already like reaching deep in there and using some of the least effective tools, in my opinion, things like extreme quantitative easing with no end, negative interest rates, whereas the Fed still has a little bit more ammo there that that is more likely to be effective in stimulating the economy if it comes down to that. So for okay. that reason, that's that's kind of the fundamental appeal of the U.S. dollar. So it's uh, kind of like easier, a catch up but... move in the U.S. to what's been happening in Europe for a long time. Yes, exactly. That's my okay. view is, is the... Okay. As much as, as much as it doesn't feel like it, the the Fed in the U.S. has been a little bit. I don't want to say ahead of the curve, but maybe ahead of some major rivals in terms of addressing this this very slow, stagnant recovery from the great financial crisis. So some of these tools have been at least moderately effective in the U.S., whereas you know Japan and Europe have have been perpetually even further behind the curve. Um, so maybe transitioning back here to the U.S. dollar index. The this is a daily chart, and the key level I'd be watching at this point is around, um, and I've got the wrong scale on here, regular. Let's just remove this scale. Who are you working with nowadays, Matt? Uh, yeah, Daily this is FX? a good chance for me to uh, plug. Uh, so, so I am uh, the global head of research at Gain Capital, uh, which Gain. of course is Forex.com uh, in the US. And then we also have uh, Forex.com brand in other regions as well as City Index. Uh, well, so I've been here on and off for 10 years. Thank you. Yeah. You, it's, it's you were a I young enjoyed. guy when I first met you. I know. Yep. It's still, still enough to me. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm chasing <laughs> you down in gray hairs. Uh, we right, just man. had uh, our first child. So uh, I've, I've been oh. getting gray hairs at a record pace. Your best long-term position trade. Ah, uh, we'll see. Maybe Having not financially, but, uh, <laughs> but she'll be picking my nursing home one day. So I think it's a good, it's got a good benefit. <laughs> <laughs> Good one, buddy. Um, so, so yeah, the, the key level I wanted to highlight here on the dollar index, 99.40. That was roughly resistance that we saw back here in September and October. Uh, we broke above that level last week, and we were just really getting stretched. There was a lot of demand for the U.S. dollar, I think, both from a safe haven perspective and from that relative yield advantage. As you said, it hasn't been changing that much, but it still is a positive carry relative to, especially in the case of the dollar index, you're talking about the euro. So I think that sentiment by the end of last week was a little bit excessive. And we saw a pullback here to the short term moving average. I used the eight day exponential moving average. But we also saw a pullback to that previous resistance level at 99.40. So okay. uh, it, I'm not surprised that we're seeing the dollar find a bit of support so far today. And this area here will be what I'm watching on a short term basis. If we do break below I'd still be pretty bullish on the U.S. dollar, but I wouldn't be surprised to see a, a deeper drop towards, say, 99 or the mid-98s in the, the next week or two. Um, and that perhaps could present a buying opportunity for, for similarly bullish traders. You have but a as long, long as term, we're staying here, You I'm have bullish. a long-term upside target for the dollar if it continues. I mean, there are super bulls talking, you know, 107, 110. Uh, are you in that camp or is 102 – um, something that you see is much more achievable. Yeah, if I bounce this out to uh, a weekly chart here, basically the highest price we've seen the dollar trade at, and man, if I zoom this out, this has been you know over a decade now, uh, yeah. that the highest price we've traded as this 103.50 area. Yeah. For that reason, I, I don't think we're in kind of this this massive, secular, profoundly bullish U.S. dollar environment. I just think it's the best house in a bad neighborhood right now. Got so, um, yeah, so 107 sounds a bit extreme for me. We'll see what happens. Um, you know, obviously the dollar could go down. Even using relatively few indicators, you're, you're never going to be direct, correct on direction every time. But I think in time, uh, if we can get over this parity level, then a move up toward 103.50 could be in play. Okay. You know, a lot of people are scratching their heads, um, myself included, because of a correlation breakdown last week in U.S. dollar yen, because uh, normally in risk off, um, when gold's going up, U.S. dollar yen's going down, and when yields are going down, normally, you know, it was a safe haven play to, uh, for a stronger yen and shorting U.S. dollar yen. Uh, knowing fundamentals like you do, is this a new paradigm that's occurring here in the end? What are your thoughts for these correlations breaking down? Is it just because of Corona and no one wants to touch anything or belong any Asian currency right now? I think that's a big part of it, Dale, to be honest. It's, um, I, I think you're correct from a macro sense. You know, if we have general concerns about the overall global economy, I, I still do think the yen could benefit, uh, certainly not to the extent the U.S. dollar has. But 
what we saw last week was that the, the fears went from global to specific idiosyncratic fears about the Japanese economy. Last week, we had that, uh, I think it was a minus 1.6% quarter over quarter GDP reading. So that's, that's projecting over a year. If we saw that continue to be a minus 6% contraction in Japanese GDP, this is the third largest economy on the planet. Like this is really massive news. And it was likely caused by temporary factors, a sales tax increase. In fact, yeah. the last time we saw such a big contraction Traction in Japanese GDP was back in 2014, the last time they raised sales taxes. But then we also saw, in addition to that fear, pockets of coronavirus popping up in Japan. So if that starts to metastasize, if it leads to the sort of factory shutdowns for a very heavily manufacturing oriented economy in Japan that we saw in China, then that's, I think, what traders, what spook traders when it comes to Japanese assets and including the yen, that was more than enough to overcome the, the broad macro safe haven bid that would usually be going to the end. And traders were just like, well, I might as well just buy the Swiss franc or the US dollar if I'm looking for a macro safe haven trade or gold, of course. Okay. So uh, I know you wanted to cover gold and uh, I think you mentioned that. And gold has been a home run ball from the breakout at 1380, 1360 and uh, starting to get that parabolic look to it. Um, What's your take here? Uh, you know, I, I never believed in chasing anything. And uh, I actually think there might be something counter trend setting up here. Uh, difficult. Uh, I, I actually think silver's relative weakness will make that a preferred short for a reaction. Where do you think gold's going, Matt? Are we going to take out the 2019 highs of 1900? Potentially in time. I would not expect that immediately. And, and just to sort of set the scene, around the middle of last year is where I started to get very bullish on gold. Yeah. And that was sort of historically informed. I, I don't mean to offend anyone here. And I know people who trade gold often have very strong opinions. But at, at the end of the day, for me, gold is, is not producing any income. You know, it, it's to, to say it trivially, it's a yellow rock, but it's a yellow rock that's held its value for thousands, if not tens of thousands of years. And, and what drives that value are things like real interest rates and, and frankly, just right. sentiment. So we saw, and this is a very zoomed out weekly chart here going back years, right. but we saw for after things went crazy, you know, and gold got up to that 1900 area from about 2013 to 2019, gold did nothing. It was just right. chilling here between, you know, 1100 and, and 1300. And that really, I think, uh, just, just got everyone sick of gold. You know, even, even the hardcore gold bugs, it was increasingly hard to make a compelling case for gold. And when you have that widespread apathy combined yeah. with low expectations for price moves, that can kind of set the stage for the next big move up. And then, of course, we have just the perfect macro environment for gold. There's low real interest rates, so there's low carrying cost for gold. You're not right. giving up much by buying gold. You can't earn, you know, 10% in your bank account like you could right. historically. Um, right. And we have all these central banks resorting to extreme, untested um, monetary stimulus measures. So longer term, I'm, I'm certainly a bull on gold. I had a, a colleague, uh, Fawad Razakzada, project in his bold prediction for this year that gold could go to 2000. And, and we were making that, you know, toward the end of 2019. Uh, so we were trading, say, here at, at 14 or 1500. And, and to me, that's a pretty bold prediction that such a massive asset could rise 30 Forty percent in a year, um, yeah. and it's looking like it's on track. To be honest, yeah. so, so knocking uh, on the door. Give him credit. <laughs> Who made as that far call? As a, I'm sorry. Oh, that was my colleague Fawad Razakzada. Um, oh, okay. He, he, he's actually since uh, departed the company, but uh, okay. uh, you could find him on Twitter. What um, a revolving door this business is. It, it, there's, a, there's a lot of turnover here, but, uh, but you know, it's, it's just like the markets. There's a lot of turnover in the market. So yeah. uh, it's always compelling. So maybe to, to get a little bit more short term perspective, just since we've started seeing this up move in gold, maybe the start of 2018, if we just measure this move, this is something I did just this morning to try to get a framework for kind of how gold's been moving over the last year and a half. We saw a big rally here off 1160 up to let's call it 1350. But what I really wanted to highlight is that's about a 16% move. Then we saw a very shallow controlled pullback. Nice. Yeah. If I can pull a fib on here, you probably can't see it too clearly, but uh, I'll just highlight that we're, we've pulled back to the 38.2% fib retracement and then resume the uptrend. That, that means we rallied very strongly in a relatively short period of time only pulled back about 33% of that move and then yeah. started rallying again. What did we see from there? Another decent size rally, in this case, about a 23% rally, pulled back, 
about 33%, right? That 38.2% fib uh, right. toward the end of last year. And it looks like we've seen another very similar surge. If we just see how far this move has been so far, this is what gets me a little nervous from a yeah. short-term bullish perspective and there. kind of would support your view, Dale, yeah. is that we've seen a 17% rally. So that's right between the range of these other rallies. Does that mean we can't go higher? Absolutely not. Maybe this this takes us all the way to 2000 if something weird happens. But I think the probabilities are starting to favor a pullback. And keep in mind, these previous pullbacks have only been about a third of that previous move up. So it's it's not my preferred direction to trade. But if you are an active trader, if you're comfortable with that sort of counter trend move, uh, I would be looking at the price action because we're clearly stretched relative to the moving averages. I would be looking for some sort of candlestick pattern uh, that right. could signal a potential reversal. And that way, what really makes counter trend trades because you're trading against the trend. So it's, it's naturally a lower probability of success, all else equal. Right. But if you can get a really strong risk to reward ratio that can overcome that slightly lower probability. And I know many traders who are very successful trading like that. You know what I gleaned out of that, Matt? Uh, I'm going, the pattern of only 38% Retract, uh, yeah. retracement 38.3 is like the character of the market now for years. So I would say to people that if and when we get any kind of correction in the market, that anything deeper than 38.3 would be saying the character of the market is changing. So to me, that's a real pearl that you noticed both of those corrections being one of the smallest fib retracements, more in time than price at 38.3. Thank you for that. Yeah, no, that's, I've used that terminology too, the character of the market. And I think that that has broader applications beyond, you know, just one specific thing. But if you've identified yeah. so far, you know, this uptrend's been doing approximately this. If it does something substantially different, it doesn't mean the uptrend's over or that we're going to necessarily see a reversal, but it, it should raise your antenna and have you thinking, you know, how, how is this changing? Should I expect what happened previously to continue? Perhaps not. Yeah. So um, this bloodbath in stocks today that bears have been looking for for about uh, 10 years and, you know, we're finally getting uh, a correction. Uh, I don't think it's the end of the bull market. Some people are saying it is. Uh, you have any kind of ideas of, you know, uh, five to 10% type of correction that we're going to have from here. We haven't had a 10% in a while since I think December of 2018, 2019 in there. Yep, what does it look like? What's it look like to you? So, so this is the uh, S and P E mini uh, contract right. here. We're not quite at the stock market open yet. So we'll look at right. the futures. Um, again, you, maybe we can use that same context here, the character of the market. And I'll slap what my longer term 200 day exponential moving average on here. Okay. Since the start of the fourth quarter, we've, we haven't really even broken below the 50 day exponential. Finally moving today. Average. Yeah. We did. Today, last it looks night. like we're going to open there. We've seen, <laughs> and uh, I had a colleague mention. Would it be shocking if the if the S&P 500 closed higher? And I think it probably would, but we have seen so many of these scares uh, where, where things gap down, they look very scary, and just gradually throughout the day, we grind higher and then see a furious rally at the end um, of the day and, and kind of close higher. This has been truly a Teflon market that shrugged off all of these concerns. Uh, so, so I've been burned too many times trying to call a top. Um, yeah. You know, classically, the trend is your friend until it changes. But again, using that same context of the character of the market changing, it might be reverting to the character we saw through a lot of last year, where we would see deeper retracements toward a longer term moving average. But again, this 200 day EMA continues to trend up um, yeah. as do for the moment. So where's it come in around 3100? Yeah, 200? present. We're 30, looking 80? at 3080. 30, yes, sir. So okay. um, I, I'm not even saying necessarily we will go down there. But if we do, right. that's kind of the test for the longer term character of the market. And again, that's from here, you know, that's another 100. What is that 150 points here? So yeah. uh, another 5% decline. I think we're already 4% off the highs. So that's right, right about a 10% total decline to take us down to that area. And that could be in play, uh, depending on how the news flow goes. And, and, and uh, I didn't want to get political. Kind of but you brought it up. You said burn. Oh, you said you got burned. I thought you were talking about Bernie Sanders. Oh, so oh, okay. I hopped on so for... You, uh, you have the burn? I hopped on for Steve's uh, closing thoughts, and he took something that's been bouncing around in my head uh, and really stated it articulately, and that's that uh, historically going into presidential elections, one of the best determinants of who's going to win is how the stock market performs in the August to November 
period. So right, the last you know two or three months before the election has predicted, I think, uh, if it's up, it has favored the incumbent if it, incumbent party, and if it's down, has favored the the challenging party. With I think an eighty five percent accuracy going back over the last you know relatively small sample size, but over the last you know thirty elections or so. So oh, and I think Steve correctly mentioned that there's there's a, a feedback loop there where if the stock market you know, remain strong. Well, people are going to be happy. They're going to want more of the same. Trump is more likely to get elected, especially after, you know, staking so much of his reputation on economic performance and, and the stock market. Whereas if we do see the stock market start to fall, maybe that, that decreases Trump's re-election odds and could increase the likelihood of the Democratic candidate, which in turn, they, they might be seen as less business friendly and could exacerbate that fall. So I really do think as we move into the third quarter of this year, we'll start to see more volatility in the stock market as traders try to front run each other. And if we do see one of those circles uh, develop, it, it could offer a lot of trading opportunities. Two angry men on the opposite side of the fence. Yeah, so, a bunch of and, old, angry white dudes. <laughs> so, uh, Matt, anything else you wanted to cover market-wise? Because I want to give you some time to show um, our attendees and people to see the video later where they could follow you and your research. Maybe you could show um, your link that you have on Twitter to be following your work if you want to do that now or talk about another instrument up to you. Yeah, probably uh, never want to miss a chance for a plug here. Um, as I mentioned at the top, I'm the, the head of research for Gain Capital. Um, I don't know where most of your viewership is from, but in, in the U.S., we, we offer a Forex.com brand. Uh, if you want to see what I'm thinking about markets and, and what my colleagues around the clock are thinking, you can go here to the Market Analysis tab on Forex.com and latest research. We're going to have uh, reports up all throughout the day, um, you know, nice. covering the latest. Of course, today it's all about coronavirus. And, and of yeah. course, uh, if you're in different regions, City Index would be the one to get. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not sure uh, where your viewership is primarily, but I do want to quickly Global. plug that I will be at the london trader show uh this week on friday uh oh, wow, and that's man. somewhere in west london uh so if you just google london trader show i think it's relatively cheap to attend uh would love to, to meet anyone who's interested in talk markets uh and then finally if i can get my last plug out of the way um probably the best way to stay up to date with myself uh would be on twitter i'm at M Weller FX. So M W E L L E R FX. And then of course the, uh, around the clock, the forex.com team at forex.com, uh, will be sending out tweets and, and really putting some of these market moves into context and helping traders learn how to trade. You so know, with that plug out of the way, <laughs> oh, that was, it was great hearing your voice again, my trading warrior brother, really. Absolutely. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to, uh, to be back on one time. If I can just mention one a fundamental factor that I think will determine a lot of what happens here with, uh, for instance, the S&P with the dollar, with gold, some of the major things we've talked about, it would be coronavirus cases, obviously, but it would be specifically ones outside of China. I think the markets kind of determined uh, that the cases in China are being treated seriously. Um, we'll see, you know, ultimately how this turns out. I'm not an epidemiologist or anything like that. But uh, what really I think could throw a wrench in the works here are some of these these outcroppings we've seen, especially this weekend in, in countries like South Korea, Italy, and, and last week I mentioned, of course, in Tokyo. So uh, this is, I think this is from Johns Hopkins. Yeah, here it is. Um, tracking is, it's kind of a cool dashboard to track the cases. And specifically this part down here shows the cases um, yeah, in mainland China SARS. and orange, yeah. recoveries in green, which yeah. I, I, I will note just a, a quick at the top, recoveries are increasing relatively quickly. But what we really want to look at is these other locations. This looks super minor right now. It's super low compared to how many cases we've seen in China. But if we <clears> slap <throat> this into a logarithmic chart that shows the exponential growth better, we can see that it's tracking in yeah. terms of other regions at the same percentage gain. In fact, over the last week or two at a higher percentage gain than we've seen in China. So uh, this puts it. it in a little more context. If we start to see you know, some, some more of those infections perk up, that's where traders are gonna get more scared. That's probably where we'll start to see a deeper retracement in the S&P and uh, where we could see things like gold and the US dollar benefit, in my opinion. What do you think of this, Matt? Corona, Corona, fear that I'll own ya. Born in a lab in China spreading so i'll find you no one's safe not even a king and i'll be the excuse for everything did you just come up with that off the cuff that was it i wrote it over the yeah, weekend nice. i like that you're a poet right. i didn't know yeah, it yeah i didn't either i have long fellows anyway <laughs> <laughs> matt really great talking to you and uh let's try and make it every month or so that you come back and 
share what you're thinking and your clean charts and great fundamental views. Uh, thank you for edifying face today, Matt. Will do, Dale. I'll, I'll reach out and we'll, uh, we'll try to get a more regular thing going on moving forward. Thank you and uh, best of luck with your trading, everyone. Good hunting, Matt. Everyone, Matt Weller. And I want to thank Matt for being with us. We'll see everyone for Turnaround Tuesday and be safe. Good hunting. Adios. One more thing. Don't forget, don't just count your pips, count your blessings. See you tomorrow. You're welcome.